Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Winnie Armand, and I'm a physician in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Mass General and a team member of the MGH Center for the Environment and Health. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for the first of our monthly Grand Rounds. We hope to bring you a year full of important, interesting, and insightful presentations on climate change, the environment, and health from leading experts. As you may know, dedicated folks at Mass General have been working towards institutional sustainable solutions for years, and the launching of the center is really a proud, proud milestone for us all. Um, the uh, education and engagement of our staff and the broader community is just one of our goals, and we have been so fortunate to partner with MGH Institute of Health Professions Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice, and Health for this educational series. And I'd like to turn it over to Patrice Nicholas for a few words. Thank you, Winnie. I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the MGH Institute of Health Professions and the MGH Department of Nursing and Patient Care Services. I also bring greetings from Dr. Debbie Burke, Senior Vice President of Patient Care Services and Chief Nurse, as well as Dr. Paula Milone Nazo, the President of the MGH Institute. Special thanks to Michael Busnock for all of his efforts in our first launch. Thank you. So without further ado, let's get started with our conference on understanding and preventing the adverse health impacts of extreme heat and weather. I'm going to introduce both of our speakers, starting with Dr. Willenius, who is our first speaker, followed by Reverend Walker. Um, please note that um, there is closed captioning available. So if you'd like that, you can uh, click that on your screen. Um, the other thing to note is that during this conference, you're welcome to submit questions and answers. We prefer that over the chat, which will be largely unmonitored. Um, and hopefully at the end, we'll have time for that. Uh, I apologize in advance if we, we don't get to all of them. So I'd like to present Dr. Willenius. He is a professor uh, in the Department of Environmental Health at Boston University and director of BU's new program on climate and health. Prior to joining the faculty at BU, he earned a PhD in environmental health and epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health, completed a postdoc fellowship in the cardiovascular division at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and served on the faculty in the Department of Epidemiology at the Brown University School of Public Health. His research is focused on understanding and providing the evidence needed to effectively reduce the many adverse health impacts of climate change. Reverend, Reverend Vernon Walker was originally born and raised in Philadelphia. Reverend Walker attended Penn State University for college where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in organizational leadership and a minor in psychology in 2012. After graduating from Penn State University, Reverend Walker attended Boston University School of Theology and earned a master's degree in theological studies in 2016. Reverend Walker is also academically trained in macro social work practices as he took a plethora of courses at Boston University School of Social Work. Reverend Walker is a senior fellow at the Environmental Leadership Program and a senior fellow at Tufts University, Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life through the Institute for Nonprofit Practice. Reverend Walker is part of the Pentecostal Tabernacle Church in Cambridge, where he sits on the seat committee and is responsible for helping to fund social justice organizations. We are immensely honored to have them both. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Winnie and Patrice, and thank you so much for the invitation to, to be here today. It's, it's really a great privilege to share uh, uh, my work, uh, and in particular, as we're, you know, we've already had a, a pretty uh, significant heat wave in Boston uh, this year and poised to get some more hot weather next week, I understand. So, so this is uh, really uh, timely to, to be talking about this. I'll start with my disclosures of both research funding and uh, extramural income that I've had in, in the recent past. Happy to talk about any of that if you have questions. And I'd like to just start by thanking my team uh, because it's uh, uh, really only through uh, the, the work, uh, uh, collaborative work with both uh, uh, my team at, at Boston University as, as well as with collaborators, um, as you can see at a range of institutions that, that we're able to do this uh, kind of work. So, I, I, you know, from your previous uh, 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 seminars and and in hopefully in in other venues as well, you 
probably realize that climate change affects all of us. Uh, and, you know, often when we think about climate change, we think of things like heat waves and extreme cold, uh, heavy rains and floods uh, or severe storms, droughts, wildfires, uh, maybe air pollution, sea level rise is often part of the conversation. And what, you know, all these things sound really horrible and they are, but the reason we care about this is not because they are an environmental challenge. They are an environmental challenge, but because they impact all of our health. We have to live on this planet. So there's direct impacts, like you might imagine deaths and injuries and hospitalizations, but then there's a number of more subtle impacts, uh, in, including asthma exacerbations, allergies, uh, threats to our food and water supplies uh, or property losses, and, and even the opportunity to do the things that we love to do. So, you know, you're, you know skiing in New England is getting harder and harder to, to do sustain, you know, in, in an economically viable way because of warmer winters. So a wide range of impacts. So I'd be happy to come back anytime and talk about other impacts of health. Today, I wanna to talk a, a, a bit about uh, heat. Uh, and of course, our planet has already warmed substantially from pre-industrial times. Again, that's a, you know, can be a full conversation on its own. And the reason this matters is because even these subtle shifts in the average temperature, uh, uh, the result of that is that there are many more days of extreme heat. Uh, uh, so there's days that will, more days that will become even hotter uh, in any particular location. And so you can already see these effects. This, we don't even need to go into the future. So this is uh, you know, a nice visualization from Climate Central showing days above 95 degrees. So there's, uh, we're about 20 uh, or, or 30 per year in uh, 1970 uh, with closer to 60 days per year on average uh, through the end of the year, uh, through the end of 2018. So about 30 more days of really hot weather in Houston. So every city or every part of the country is going to, you know, experience this differently. And the point is that, that these subtle shifts in temperature uh, on the global scale and even at the national scale imply lots more severe weather at the local scale. Uh, and, it, you know, as we project into the future, uh, we think that this is going to get even worse. So the number, uh, average number of very hot days is going to increase substantially through the middle of the century, through the end of the century, sort of following on these trends we've already seen. So this matters uh, because uh, uh, temperature affects people's health. So when you see, what you see here is a, a temperature on the x-axis and a exposure response function or the, you know, a curve showing the relative risk uh, on the y-axis. And so what you see is that there's this temperature at which the fewest number of people die. So uh, uh, this is uh, sometimes called the optimal temperature, temperature of minimum mortality. And as it gets hotter than this temperature, relatively more people die. And as it gets colder than this optimal temperature, relatively more people die as well. So there's impacts of both moderate and extreme heat and increasing risk associated with moderate and extreme cold. And you know, a key point of this is that the shape of these curves and that those optimal temperatures are, are actually different from location to location. So this isn't, you know, we see a pattern similar to this virtually everywhere in the world, uh, but then the actual details of the shape of that curve varies from location to location. So here you can see that in New York City, the optimal temperature temperature is higher than in London, and the, the steepness of the curve after that towards a warm end is different, and as well as towards the colder is different in New York than it is in London. So what this tells you is that this is, there's a global phenomenon here and a national phenomenon, but that the uh, specific hazards to the population is, varies from location to location. And this has been done, you know, virtually, uh, you know, in a large number of cities, virtually everywhere around the world, uh, where there's a combination of weather data available and uh, uh, data on mortality. This is some great work led by Antonio Gasparini at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So, you know, what we've done, you know, in my group is we've taken these same methods. These methods are now well worked out and applied it to uh, uh, data, uh, trying to, you know, push, push the knowledge into beyond mortality and into emergency department visits. Because, of course, you know, uh, uh, if you imagine the pyramid of, of impacts, you know, death is the most severe outcome, but it's uh, also the one that probably affects the least, the fewest number of people. And as you go down, you get less severe outcomes that require require 
medical attention, but don't kill people, fortunately. And that's going to be a larger segment of the population. So we've been looking at heat and emergency department visits using data from uh, uh, a partnership with Optum Labs, which is a division of United Healthcare. Uh, so this is, uh, they have data on about 130 million people over time that have had uh, uh, private health insurance or Medicare Advantage plans uh, uh, in their data warehouse. And we're able to, in a privacy preserving way, aggregate this data at the county or zip code level. Here you see the number of ED visits that we have to work with by county. And so if, you know, just as an example of the work here on the x-axis, you have the percentiles of summertime temperatures. Uh, and on the y-axis, you have the relative risk of either all-cause ED visits of on the left of your screen or heat-related ED visits on the right side of the screen. So what you can see here is a similar shape, and this is summertime temperatures only. So you can see that uh, as temperatures uh, go up during the summer, you have a higher risk of, of all-cause and and particularly of heat-related ED visits. Now, because this is such a large data set, we can do this even further and say, you know, let's look at a, a number of causes of disease. And so what we did is we took the top 200 um, uh, causes of, of ED visits and looked at each one of those in relationship to temperature. And just to highlight some of the top ones, uh, so you see more, you know, higher risk of ED visits for allergic reactions, for um, uh, uh, renal failure, fluid and electrolyte disorders, you, you know, some of these have been reported uh, quite a bit previously and other ones like, you know, skin disorders or uh, uh, skin and, and subcutaneous tissue infections, you know, have haven't been previously uh, uh, reported in the literature. And what I think this shows uh, is a combination of things that are directly related to exposure to heat, uh, like the fluid and electrolyte disorders probably reflects a lot of dehydration. On the other hand, the open wounds uh, in extremities and the fracture of lower limbs probably implies that on those very hot days, people are doing a different set of activities uh, than, than on, on uh, cooler days during the same time period. So an interesting mix of both sort of these direct effects and maybe behavioral changes that are uh, the result of, of hot days and things that people are doing differently. Uh, you know, we've also used the same approach to look at uh, heat and emergency department visits uh, among a network of the uh, 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 U.S. Children's Hospitals. So these are 47 standalone uh, hospitals in Boston Children's as part of this neighborhood. This is the Pediatric Health Information System. And we're able to look at, again, sort of very large numbers. This is nearly 4 million ED visits uh, for children and adolescents uh, during the, the warm months of, of 2016 to 2018. And here, rather than taking the most common causes, we took sort of this list of about two dozen uh, kind of predefined uh, uh, categories uh, of uh, causes of ED visits that so you can see, you know, obviously you get uh, 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 greater risk of heat really, you know, ED visits for heat related illness, but you also get other things that we didn't necessarily expect like bacterial enteritis and otitis media. Again, some of these have been shown before uh, while others are, are new. And this is in collaboration with Ari Bernstein at, at Boston Children's Hospital. So, you know, you know that's us and, and many, many others uh, have really shown that extreme heat is associated with higher rates of death and hospitalization. And this has been shown nationally in the US and, and really uh, uh, in many places across the world. Interestingly, moderate heat, uh, so days that you don't necessarily think that they pose a risk, but that uh, the, the, the data shows that it's uh, even moderately elevated temperatures are associated with higher rates of death and probably with hospitalization as well, although less good data on that. We know that vulnerability uh, varies by personal housing and neighborhood characteristics so that this is, you know, a, a, again, every city, every neighborhood, every community, every household is going to react differently. Uh, so a, a very localized problem. And the U.S. has already warmed uh, substantially. It's projected to, to warm even further through the end of the century. So, you know, that's great. And that's, you know, really important science. But you know, there's a challenge here where we recognize that excess heat is a 
threat to public health. But yet in the U.S., more people die of extreme heat each year than of any other meteorologic event. This is, you know, according to data from CDC and NOAA. So to me, that implies that as a community, we haven't yet made sufficient progress towards preventing heat-related illness and death. So we know that it's a problem, we, we, you know, scientifically, and yet we're not able to translate this abundant scientific knowledge into uh, uh, effective public health action. So I want to talk a little bit about our, our research on, on that front. Um, so I would argue that local public health agencies and emergency preparedness officials, really what they need to know is super localized. So, you know, they, you know, there's something about how we communicate. We do these studies on a very large scale, nationally, internationally, globally, um, but yet the solutions are all supposed to be local or have to really effectively be local. So, so what, you know, the, the mayor of Boston, you know, mayor Cambridge needs to know is what are the health risks associated with the given hazard, in this case, heat to my community. And what are the actions that can be taken to protect the public's health uh, from these exposures? And then we have to assess, do these actions actually reduce risk? And there's surprisingly little research about how we protect people from extreme heat, oops, as well as from other disasters. So, you know, one of the things that, that we can do is provide results in a much more localized fashion. So it's great that we do these things on a national scale, but then can we show results at a more localized scale to inform local policy? So this was a, a study that uh, led by Kate Weinberger, who is a former postdoc with me now working at University of British Columbia uh, as faculty. And, you know, so she took some mortality data from, you know, the uh, 300 most populous counties in the U.S. And, and, you know, you can actually calculate for each county what is the uh, uh, excess uh, uh, rate of heat-related deaths, uh, you know, on, on hot days. And you can see that the effect is not or the association is not constant across the country. Uh, it's much more pronounced, for example, in the Northeast and as well as some other places. And we can also count then how many deaths. So like the relative risk isn't really actionable in the same way that saying, hey, in the US, there's in these 300 most populous counties, there's 2,300 deaths per year attributable to extreme heat. And which is about an order of magnitude higher than the estimates from the CDC based on death certificate data that says, you know, here's the death certificates that say that heat was a contributing cause. So we think that that's a substantial underestimate of the burden of heat. So we can do a lot of things with the big data, but transform it into ways that becomes locally actionable. Uh, similarly, we did a, a, a study a few years ago now, uh, uh, pooling data from 15 New England uh, cities and towns uh, in Rhode Island, uh, New Hampshire, uh, and Maine. And, you know, none of these states and cities and towns have enough data on their own to uh, see, you know, have enough uh, statistical power to see the association. But by pooling it, we can look at the overall association and then look at sort of location specific associations. So as we had expected uh, in, in these 15 towns, there's a relationship that as, you know, the maximum daily heat index gets hotter, the relative risk of both ED visits and deaths goes up. Um, so that relative risk, again, is important to show, but really, you know, a better way to show it in this table is a, a little bit complex, but basically what I'm trying to do here is show that for days above a specific maximum daily heat index, like 100 degrees, how many people in these 15 cities and towns actually, you know, go to the ED visit you know, what's the excess relative or the excess absolute risk on those days. So in these 15 towns, it was all the days above 100 degrees led to about 39 additional ED visits. If you just count the same day, more if you sort of acknowledge that today's heat will also affect some ex excess admissions tomorrow and the day after. And same thing for deaths, about four to eight excess deaths. So in this area, we don't get that many days uh, above 100 degrees, but these relatively limited number of days contribute to, you know, an appreciable number of excess deaths and ED visits. So, you know, going from the relative risk to an actual number of people or number of ED visits and deaths uh, uh, makes that more actionable. And, you know, with our partners in the research and partnering with the National Weather Service offices in the area, we were able to say, hey, look, 
we're seeing more people go to the ED and more people die, even on days that we don't consider as extreme heat. So uh, using that information, the National Weather Service changed the criteria for issuing heat advisories uh, in uh, around Christmas 2016 uh, to uh, lower that threshold from 100 degrees to a, a heat index of 95 degrees. So we thought, hey, this is wonderful. We, we generated data, we can influence policy, and look, we you know, now have heat advisories in the area issued at a, a lower level, that, and we think that this should protect people. So that brings me to sort of the, the, the final uh, uh, part of this is like, well, okay, we think that heat warning should protect people. Does the data show that they do? Uh, so local health departments all across the country are having these conversations with the National Weather Service of, hey, maybe we should issue heat warnings or heat advisories at lower temperatures than uh, they're currently issued. But this assumes that the heat advisories or warnings being issued are uh, actually reducing heat-related morbidity and mortality. And there's been relatively few studies actually addressing that question. So a wonderful thing about heat warnings is that they're based on forecast heat index. And forecasts, as we all know, can be wrong. And they don't need to be really wrong or wrong by a lot. They can be wrong by a little bit. Um, also, the warnings from the National Weather Service are issued by people, not by algorithms. And so uh, there's some judgment involved there of, of when should we issue one. So we speculated that there'd be a set of days in any given city that are similarly hot as measured by the heat index, some of which have a heat warning and some of which you don't, some of which don't. So there might be a, a, a day that was 100, ended up being 101 degree, uh, but because of the small forecast error and people's judgment, uh, they didn't issue a heat warning. And then there may be another day that uh, you know gets to uh, a heat index of 99 degrees, but because it, um, again, because of forecast error and judgment, maybe they did issue a heat warning. So we can that gives us you know a set of days that we can use to test this hypothesis of whether two days that are equally hot, one with a heat warning, one without, whether the heat warnings have uh, uh, a benefit on reducing mortality. So we did that study and in 20 cities using you know, data on deaths through 2006. And we found that overall, we you see the summary estimate here, uh, uh, that overall that uh, heat alerts, uh, these are warnings and advisories were not associated with a, you know, important reduction in mortality. Uh, so that was across the 20 cities. Interestingly, in Philadelphia, you see this four or four and a half percent reduction in the risk of death on a hot day on the days that have a heat warning. And that's super interesting uh, because Philadelphia has for a long time, for many decades now, uh, paid a lot of attention to, to the health impacts of heat wave and they have a sophisticated early warning system and considerable public health action. So whether this is you know, random chance that one out of 20 showed a association in the direction we expect or whether that truly means something, you know, different for Philadelphia um, is to be, you know, determined in future research. But if all the heat warnings in the country were as effective as they were in Philadelphia, that could actually save like lots of lives so, or avert lots of deaths. So in Philadelphia, we estimated that each year there's about nine heat alerts issued each year in Philadelphia and that that saves on average about 45 deaths per year. So if that's true, that's a significant number. It shows the, the, you know, the, the sort of untapped potential of heat warnings that if we can make them as effective as they are in Philadelphia, then we could actually across the country save lots of uh, save lots of lives. So are heat warnings effective? Uh, maybe. So they may reduce the risk of death in some cities, but we don't yet find evidence of widespread health benefits. And if that's true, that's you know a huge missed opportunity to prevent heat related morbidity and mortality. Lots of limitations with the research, and we're you know working on on updated you know updated data, updated methods, and moving not just looking at mortality but also at hospitalizations and ED visits. So stay tuned to to what newer research finds. But so far, there's not dramatic evidence that they're effective. So that comes back to, to the problem we have here that, you know, again, we think we understand the adverse health impacts of heat on a global and a national scale, uh, but we haven't really been able to translate that, you know, wealth of scientific knowledge into public health action. And so, you know, my claim is that there's insufficient evidence to guide public health response 
in the present day or for future heat. So as I think uh, Reverend Walker is going to speak about, there's really, you know, the elements of an effective public health response are, are well known. So you have to, in the context of heat specifically, you'd have to define what we mean by dangerous heat, how hot is too hot, how hot is dangerous for who. Uh, we have to forecast uh, uh, that hot weather in advance. So we have an effective early warning system, identify who's at greatest risk of harm, intervene to reduce those risks and in, in those vulnerable populations, evaluate how we're doing, uh, you know, did we, were we effective in reducing the health harms? And then we have to repeat the cycle over and over for, and do it for a number of different uh, climate hazards and repeatedly over time. So, so that's where much of our research is, is heading. Uh, and again, I wanna close by uh, highlighting, you know, the, that all of this is, is possible because of the hard work of, of many other people on the team and wonderful collaborators uh, across the country and including Canada. So uh, with that, I will stop and turn it over to uh, Reverend Walker. Uh, thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wallerstein, uh, for sharing that uh, poignant presentation with us uh, with a lot of information that we need to know uh, related related to heat waves uh, and it is it is important that we know that uh, we know that information uh, you know so I am glad to be here with you all today uh, as mentioned uh, I, I, my name is the Reverend Vernon K Walker I have the privilege of being the program manager at the communities responding to extreme weather. And this is a very timely and appropriate conversation as Dr. Uh, uh, as, as Dr. Uh, as Dr. Greg mentioned, uh, because we had a, a, a heat wave, a, a deep heat wave, a impactful heat wave, a dangerous heat wave uh, in, in Boston. And the reality of it is uh, that we know heat waves will continue to increase in greater intensity and in greater scope uh, because the climate has been changing and is changing. Uh, in fact, climate, the climate has been changing since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and simply when we talk, of, simply put, when we talk about climate change, we're talking about you know, long-term weather patterns that the earth is experiencing. Uh, also, uh, we're focusing today on extreme heat, but we'll talk a little bit more about different examples of extreme uh, weather. Uh, but before we delve into that, uh, I'll, I'll be remiss if I didn't thank the wonderful team that has put this together uh, folks at MGH and other partners that have uh, put this together, uh, this very informative, important discussion. Uh, and simply, I am a hippopotamus glad and elephant happy to be here on today uh, with you all in virtual land. And I'm glad that you are here today, uh, the participants here in virtual land. And although I cannot see the names of who you are and, and, all, and all of who you are, I am so grateful uh, that you have taken the time out of your busy schedule, your busy life, to be here to learn about this very relevant uh, and important subject. So let's let's give a little bit of context before we get into what CREW does and what we're about and how we do what we do. Uh, so uh, CREW, uh, Communities Responding to Extreme Weather, uh, is a part of a of a, of a larger nonprofit or bigger nonprofit uh, called the Better Future Project. And the Better Future Project works to build uh, works to build a powerful grassroots movement to address the climate crisis and advance a rapid and responsible transition beyond oil or coal, oil and gas towards a renewable energy for us all. Uh, we have three programs that are, that are part of the Better Future Project, uh, 350 Massachusetts, uh, Divest Ed, and CREW, Communities Responding to Extreme Weather. Uh, and while time won't allow me to 
uh, do the subject justice of delving into all the uh, important uh, impactful work that 350 does and the important impactful work that Divest Ed does. Uh, you can go to our website uh, at thebetterfuture.org to find out more about what those programs do and the and and the uh, scope in which uh, they operate. Uh, however, we're here to talk about weather. We talk talk about climate. To talk about uh, to talk about about uh, as uh, Dr. Greg mentioned, uh, this extreme heat. But let's 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 uh, backtrack for a second. Crew to provide a organizational context for you all. Crew is the youngest, is a young grassroots organization that aims to build equitable, inclusive neighborhood climate resilience in New England through hands-on education, service, and planning. And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so because the climate is changing, we have different approaches and perspective to climate change. We have the mitigation perspective and we have adaptation and crew focuses more on adaptation, but I wanna provide a very simple example that I'd like for you to ponder on to understand uh, the scope of the work that we do at crew. Uh, so imagine you are leaving your house one day and it's raining outside and you notice that it's raining uh, tremendously and profusely, it's raining. Uh, well, the Folks in the climate justice movement that are doing mitigation work, uh, and that's a lot of what 350 does and Divest Ed does, they would get a fan and try to blow the rain back up to the sky uh, to work at the root cause of the problem. So we think of that as mitigation. Then there are folks who uh, tap into adaptation. So with that same analogy, imagine that you see it's raining outside and you don't want to get a fan because you're in a rush somewhere and you got to get to a meeting now that the that meetings are being held more in person now. And you decide to go get a raincoat and an umbrella uh, to, to uh, brace the storm, to brace the inclement weather. Well, that uh, sisters and brothers, are, is called adaptation. Uh, so adapting to the problem that's presented because the climate is changing. Uh, so the reality of it is that uh, that is what we simply do at CREW in that thinking, to adapt to the extreme weather, to adapt to the heat waves. And how, does it, and how extreme weather manifests itself in New England is sea level rise, extreme heat, uh, uh, severe winters, et cetera. So we are in the, uh, the, the mind frame of helping people to adapt uh, in Massachusetts and across New England. Uh, we have some programs uh, beyond New England that we'll get to in just a second. Uh, so let us walk through, uh, uh, if you will, the climate impacts uh, that we see here and are expected to see here in New England. Oh, let's start with heat. Uh, so if we'll look at this chart, uh, we see that in the time frame from 1971 to 2000, and Dr. Greg touched on this a lot, uh, we see that, uh, that there were over, uh, and just so you know, the, the, the shaded boxes here represent weather that's over 90 degrees. Uh, so we see uh, that there are, I'm sorry, this represents the, the, the shaded box, the dark shaded boxes, uh, represent weather that's over 95 degrees. So we see in these uh, shaded boxes, the light orange represents weather that's over 90 degrees. So we see from 71, from 1971 to 2000, there were about 11 uh, days of temperature over 90 degrees. Uh, here in 2015 and 2044, uh, we see that it's predicted to be over uh, 31 days of extreme heat uh, over temperatures over 90 degrees. And we see from 2055 to 2084 that there is expected to be over 60 days of extreme heat. And keep in mind that there are only summertime is, an, is only about 91 days in the, in, in the Boston and greater Boston area. 
So for most of that time, depending on how much the climate continues to change and how much pollution goes in the, in the air, uh, we are see, expected to see, uh, again, over 61 degrees of, uh, 61 days of extreme heat by 2084. Uh, there's an article that should be dropped in the chat uh, the WBUR released, if we could drop that in the chat. Uh, and that said, uh, that says uh, that there are, uh, that out Boston is, in the greater Boston area, is expected to feel like Alabama in 2100 because of the severity of hot days. Uh, and we know that uh, because of the because of the the greenhouse gases and the burning of fossil fuels, coal and gas, that the Earth is warming up and the greenhouse gas effect is getting deeper and deeper. Uh, and we saw that in 2018, the UN released a report that says that we got we have up to 12 years to slow down uh, the 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 rapid change of the global temperature and keep it to 1.5 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit or above which there will be millions of people who experience climate related poverty. So this is a video here uh, and we don't have time to watch it, but we'll sh make sure to share that with you. Uh, that's from the 1995 Chicago heat wave. Um, and in that heat wave, uh, there were over, uh, there, there was 739 people that died uh, in 1995 because of this uh, deadly heat wave. Uh, and there, there have been many articles written about uh, the Chicago heat wave and many communities impacted. Disproportionately affected were communities of low wealth, communities of color, uh, folks who have had pre-existing conditions uh, such as cardiac conditions, such as uh, uh, asthma, if you will. Uh, a lot of these folks were disproportionately affected uh, by the heat wave. Um, and it's interestingly enough that although all communities uh, will face the, the, the burden of climate change, there are communities that are hit the hardest. And, those, and these are communities, what it would look like in Boston, it would be communities such as Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, uh, parts of the South End, et cetera. Uh, that that flood more uh, South Boston that that flood more when it rains that that uh, that suffer from urban heat island effect uh, and in that article it talks about that that is shared or will be shared it talks about the urban heat island effect and the Ashmont area uh, feeling much hotter and for those much hotter than what other parts of the city uh, the Ashmont area in Dorchester uh, and the reason that is is because the lack of trees. Uh, it, is, it, is the no, it is duly noted that when there are trees in the area, that not only is it beneficial for pulling carbon out of the air, but it also can help cool that local community down. Uh, so I wanna deal with one other extreme impact. Uh, so rain and snow. So you see these numbers here, but the 55%, uh, so what this uh, points out between 1958 and 2016 uh, is, uh, the top 1% of storms, of rain and snowstorms in New England uh, during this time period, uh, it, it, the top 1% increased by 55%. It was 55% precip precipitation. Uh, it increased by because the climate is changing. So let me actually, uh, now I talked a little bit about Boston. I wanna uh, incorporate Cambridge into this. So this is Kendall Square. This is Central Square, not too far from NGH. Uh, and we see all this purple here. So this is actually storm water flooding. So when it rains and as these storms are getting stronger, it creates a ripple effect. And one of the, and one of the uh, ripple effects is uh, storm water runoff and areas flooding because of storm water runoff. And this is different than sea level rise, or this is different than flooding that is caused because the, the sea levels are rising. Uh, so simply put, storm water runoff happens because uh, there are uh, gigantic rainstorms that are happening and therefore the area is flooding because of such. And so we see that in Central and in Kendall, 
areas will be consistently flooded. So, uh, so now let's talk about sea level rise and coastal flooding. Uh, so sea level rise, so this is by 2030, uh, sea level rise uh, is happening and has been happening. And what, what, the result, what the result is here is that there will be more flooding because of sea level rise. So in the Boston area, we see the Boston Commons here, we see that there's, this is about 2030, uh, this, we see that certain parts will be flooding uh, as the sea level is rising. These areas are prone to flood more. Then we see by, then we see by, uh, then we see by, then we see by current, uh, we see current flooding at 2050. We see uh, current flooding by 2050 we see that more areas are being flooded and at risk of flooding because of sea level rise. Then we see by 2070, we see it growing much, much more and encompassing more and more areas of Boston. So when we think of places like Back Bay, uh, which is on landfill, and a lot of Boston is on landfill, when we think of areas like the Seaport District, uh, and we think of places like Marcy uh, Boulevard and Gallivan Boulevard in Dorchester, these communities and, and many more will see increased flooding because of uh, because of the, the because of sea uh, because of coastal flooding and sea and, and, and sea more flooding because of uh, sea level rise uh, and also stormwater runoff. And for an example, uh, parts of East Boston, there's a part of East Boston not far from Maverick Station that actually consistently floods when uh, there are strong when there is a storm when there are storms. Uh, so this is this is the issue. So not only do we see this happening. So we have to consider the cycle and the social and psychological impacts uh, that we expect to see. So let's talk quickly about the psychological effects of climate change and of, of extreme weather disasters and events. So let's talk about Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, for instance. Uh, up to 54% of adults and 45% of children suffered a depression after a natural disaster in general. 49% of Hurricane Katrina survivors develop an anxiety or mood disorder. One in six develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Suicide and suicide ideation, ideation more than double. Outside of the United States, the suicides of 60,000 Indian farmers over the past three decades have been directly linked to climate change. An increase of five degrees Celsius, nine degree Fahrenheit on any given day was the cause, was the cause of many, many, many deaths. Uh, and I can't see that number because it's about 335 deaths. This is atrocious. So let's talk about the cr crumbling community effect. Uh, and then I'm not going to be with you too much more longer. Uh, but let's talk about the crumbling community effect. So climate change affects the way we think about ourselves, each other, and the world. After a climate event, uh, uh, after a climate event resulting in dis or, or resulting displacement, people may experience the diminished sense of self, difficulty relating to others, diminished social interaction, and sociology. That's really a fifty cent word that means the loss of sense of place, solace, uh, and security tied to one's physical environment. Interestingly enough that when there are more extreme heat, for an example, or when there's more extreme weather events uh, happens, uh, particularly when there's more extreme uh, heat, uh, there are community impacts that happen, such as an increase in domestic abuse, child abuse, violence, e.g. assault and civil conflict, economical security and physical damage and other potential effects. So this is known as the crumbling community effect. However, cooperation, cooperation entails, cooper, uh, cooperation entails establishing social ties and connections with community members. This will help withstand and encourage adaptation. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today is 
social connectedness in the midst of extreme weather. So the reason that 739 deaths, as awful as it was in Chicago, was not a thousand or two thousand or three thousand is because people, neighbors were connecting with each other. And simply put, that's how we at Crew envision encouraging adaptation to extreme weather. So the question that you may be pondering in your mind after we went through some of the projections of how extreme heat is going to impact the region, after we went through some of the projections of how storms are going to impact the region and uh, storm water runoff, storm water runoff, and sea level rise is going to impact our region. The question you may be wondering: What does crew do with all this? I'm really so glad you asked on today because I'm here to provide an answer for you. So one of the things that we do is we encourage and uh, and building up community teams. Uh, so currently we have one in Somerville and Cambridge. Um, and the, the purpose of these teams is for neighbors to connect with each other, to get to know each other uh, in a, in a uh, way that is natural, in a way that fosters a sense of belonging and community. Uh, so what, what we've seen our one team do, or our, we have one team that represents both cities, St. Somerville and Cambridge, is they, before the pandemic, they hosted a lot of, uh, climate socials. Uh, they have been proactive in connecting with other groups uh, in both cities, Somerville and Cambridge, uh, and uh, com uh, community groups, uh, as well as faith groups, etc. Uh, because the reality of it is that we're stronger together than we are apart. If the pandemic has highlighted anything uh, it, that we should take away. And there are several lessons that we should take away because the pandemic has highlighted a lot of a lot of important lessons. The important lesson that I believe that the pandemic has laid to bear is that we're all interconnected. Dr. King said that we are all tied in the inescapable garment of mutuality. What affects one directly affects us all indirectly. Uh, and, he, and then he went on to say that I cannot be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And then when that happens, then we can create this beloved community. And really that was the main impetus behind Dr. King's dream is creating a beloved community where all people, regardless of religion, nationality, color, creed, uh, uh, ethnicity, language spoken, can live together in harmony, to live together in peace, to live together, to live together and lean into this idea of uh, uh, just uh, having respect and admiration uh, and treating each other with care and kindness because we are human. If I can lean theologically for a second, lean into some theological language just for a second uh, and not not and not really bore you, uh, there's this term known as imago Dei. So what imago Dei means is uh, made in the image of God. So uh, we, for us, for us who have religious inklings and who are religiously inclined, uh, uh, all humanity is made in the image of God for thus for us who espouse that belief. So it is that very fact that we uh, should respect other folks and learn to accept other folks in spite of our differences. Uh, and it was uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu that said that I cannot be human without you because we can only be human, we can be human together because our humanity is wrapped up into one another. So community teams, so community teams, the focus of this is to build social resiliency. The focus of this is to build social cohesion and co social connectedness and on the local level and local communities, neighborhood by neighborhood, because the reality of it is that we have some vulnerable people who live within various communities and some communities have, or perhaps dis, disproportionately have more vulnerable people uh, to uh, more, more vulnerable people, more vulnerable people who are more vulnerable to the extreme weather that climate change causes and potentially experiencing um, deep impact, perhaps death uh, from uh, the climate changing uh, and because we have some of these vulnerable uh, folks living in our communities, it's important that, that, that there be some social cohesion. And that's really the idea. Uh, and there was one, 
book written by the sociologist, Dr. Eric Klingenberger on this 1995 Chicago heat wave. And he did a block by block analysis and in his book, and he's over at NYU now. And he talks about that uh, the biggest factor and the, pr the biggest predictor uh, indicator of survivability for extreme weather events or extreme heat is social connectedness. Do your neighbors know each other? If your neighbor, if your neighbor have not seen you or if a neighbor has not seen a fellow neighbor uh, in a few hours, are they calling in to do a wellness check? Are they calling in to see how they are doing? And that's what we encourage uh, teams to do. Uh, and we're looking to build more teams across, across the region. Uh, and we're working with several different groups uh, in, in frontline communities to, to get these teams going and getting more teams going. So that's one approach that we have. Another approach is resiliency hubs. Uh, so uh, resiliency hubs are organizations uh, that have a physical space that welcome in the community. And we have three levels of the resiliency hubs. Uh, however, the commonality of all the different levels. And time won't allow me to go through the different levels, but you can check out our website, climatecrew.org, and you can see the different levels and with the different responsibilities. But the commonalities in the different levels are that all the organizations, uh, and, and right now we have several different faith communities, we have several different libraries, we have a community organization in Canada, we have about 68 hubs in total, 67 across America and one in Canada near Ontario. Uh, so uh, what, uh, the commonality with all, with all our hubs, uh, no matter what level they are, uh, is that they agreed to host at least one yearly event about climate preparedness uh, and climate readiness. Uh, according to their particular region. Uh, they uh, agree to display a lot of emergency preparedness information. Uh, so crew, we have a lot of uh, information to prepare people for extreme heat and ways in which, and I'll just highlight a little bit of that, uh, in a decal. And we normally send these organizations a decal uh, so they can indicate that they are a hub. So the most important thing about extreme weather is making a plan. Uh, and I'm almost done here because we want to leave a little time for Q&A. Uh, but one way to make a plan is, is to, to prepare for heat, for an example, is to cover your windows with drapes and shades and aluminum foil cardboard. cardboard. And this, again, this is pragmatic tips that you can take. Another is find a cool place in your community. So I mentioned that a lot of our hubs are a lot of our hubs are libraries, uh, and a lot of a lot of these organizations have been closed uh, to the community because of the pandemic, and they have leaned into virtual events. Uh, but now that more and more people are becoming vaccinated and, and more organizations are opening up, uh, we anticipate that some of these organizations will begin to open their doors, uh, perhaps to a pre-pandemic level. Uh, or to a level of which they feel that is makes sense for their community. Uh, so, uh, so preparing for the heat, so covering windows, finding a cool place, never leaving a child, never leaving a child, adult or animal alone inside a car on a warm day. Now, again, these are make, may seem like all practical uh, tips, uh, and may, they may uh, practical. They are practical tips. They all may seem like common sense, but we just want to emphasize. Uh, we want to emphasize it uh, and avoid exercise, a strenuous exercise. Uh, wear loose, uh, lightweight, light color clothing. Uh, check, and then checking in on neighbors. Uh, checking in perhaps with the grandmother who lives on the block and she may be an empty nesser or the mother who may be elderly who may be an empty nesser. And maybe she has family that lives outside of the state, and maybe she doesn't have immediate family within her vicinity. Uh, I think neighbors checking in on her because they're in close proximity will help her to ensure that she has what she needs. Uh, certainly uh, faith communities, uh, a lot of faith communities already do this. A lot of churches and other uh, institutions are more so familiar with churches uh, than other perhaps synagogues or mosques they may do uh, wellness checks on their most vulnerable members. but. I would imagine that they, those faith communities do it as well. Uh, and, and this is before the flood, and then we'll, 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 we'll close this here and open it up, and then I'll turn it back over uh, to the moderator. 
so make an emergency plan before flooding, because we talked about flooding in this uh, presentation. Uh, build an emergency preparedness kit, a book bag that has the items you need if you, if in case your power goes out, such as a, a battery operated flashlight, such as maybe waterproof matches to be able to, to, to light, to be able to see in a dark house, et cetera. Uh, put electronics and important documents on high shelves. Sign up for Code Red or Alert Boston. Charge devices and back up the batteries. Clear gutters, downsprouts, and drains. Most importantly, buy flood insurance. And a lot of the elected officials are proposing for retrofitting of buildings uh, in the in the greater Boston and greater Boston area uh, to withstand and to adapt to the increased floods that we shall see. So I'm gonna end it right here. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to our wonderful esteemed moderators uh, to come on. And as we have, uh, we have maybe we wanna take a few questions or two. And thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Walker and Dr. Wilenius. Some terrific questions came up in the Q&A and Dr. Wilenius did respond to some of them. I, uh, one question was about protocols for coaches uh, in extreme heat. And I wonder if you'd like to comment about that, Dr. Wilenius. Yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, I, I think that, you know, one of the challenges is that there's not consistent guidelines or even advice on how we, you know, what what's dangerous to and to who and then what we do about it. So the, the example of sports is, is fantastic. You know, one of, you know, one of my daughters plays soccer uh, in the areas the, 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 the youth organization is Bay Soccer, the, the, the Bay Area Youth Soccer Association. And, you know, they set their guidelines for all the participating clubs, but the schools set different guidelines. And so when, you know, sometimes you can get into this paradoxical situation where sort of this is a, 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 a you know, the weather is unsuitable for one organization's soccer games to go on, but the other organization's games, you know, aren't, uh, 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 canceled. And so, so we don't have consistent advice. And I think that's just, again, sort of a failure of translation of evidence uh, into action um, and incomplete evidence, right? right? We don't really know what the risks are for different age kids, for kids doing different sports. And maybe it depends on whether you're on turf or on grass, et cetera. So, so there's not this great advice. I think one of the main shortcomings is also that we haven't really uh, engaged with school nurses uh, to help protect kids. So we, you know, the first step would be to actually understand what the risks are to uh, uh, kids during the school day. Uh, should you cancel recess? Should you go outside to recess, but encourage the kids to stay in the shade? What are the most likely uh, excess risks faced by kids? And then what are you going to do about it? And even the school nurses, because they typically in, in, Massachusetts work for the health department of the city, not for the school board, this is a great avenue to sort of, you know, even for risk communication and risk education. So I think that there, you know, huge number of missed opportunities or, or, or potential opportunities as we move forward. Yes. I, I also placed in the chat a, a PBS NewsHour link, the hotter the planet gets, the less children are learning. And it's a report of a Harvard study nationwide using PSAT and SAT scores and also controlling for whether schools were air conditioned or not. And Winnie Armand, Dr. Armand notes that in Chelsea, the city does not allow air conditioning to be turned on until 615. I know, for example, that the city of Boston, many of the schools uh, are older brick schools without the ability to control for for heat stress for children and teachers, et cetera. And also there are emerging, there is emerging literature and systematic reviews that look at ambient air pollution and heat stress and the negative effects on pregnant women. I wonder if you could comment about any of that, Dr. Wilenius and Reverend Walker. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll start briefly and then turn it over to Reverend Walker. So, so definitely, like, you know, there's a number of potentially vulnerable populations, including pregnant women. And again, you know, what are the impacts of extreme heat on uh, women, you know, pregnant women and, and the unborn child? Uh, so we, we've, you know, shown that, that uh, 
uh, hot days of extreme heat can precipitate a preterm birth. So, uh, you know, so how do we put, you know, if that's borne out in additional research, how do we protect women? And it's partly through messaging, but exactly what's the best way besides just staying in air conditioned space? Not everybody has the option of staying in air conditioned space. And, you know, I just want to emphasize that, that none of this is critical. There's, there's actually, it's hugely, hugely complicated. So we should air condition our schools, but it's not so simple because many of them are older, don't have uh, 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 HVAC systems that are amenable to adding air conditioning. Many of them shut off the air conditioning during the summer when the building's not in use and then mold accumulates and that becomes a, a different hazard. So, you know, these are really complicated problems. And I, I think data, good data to on which to base decisions is the starting point, but obviously, you know, you're balancing many factors, including huge costs uh, to, to any of these options. So Reverend Walker, your, your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilderness. Uh Yeah, certainly, you know, the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, we at Crew, we've actually, we've given out AC units. We were actually in the Boston Globe last week. We gave out a hundred and about seven air conditioning units last year to low-income residents in Brockton. Uh, we anticipate about giving out about a hundred air conditioning units this summer to low-income residents in Brockton. Um, energy efficient, low-income, uh, energy efficient uh, ACs to low-income residents uh, because, you know, not although everyone can afford one, and we know there's certainly you know different levels of socioeconomical status that plays into that. Uh, what we try, what we've done, uh, we work with partner organizations in Brockton uh, last summer, and we uh, were such as the Authentic Caribbean Foundation, such as Self Help Inc., uh, and we're also working with these organizations again to uh, to, uh, to 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 distribute these AC units. Uh, this summer that we're looking forward to. And I believe Michael will drop the, the, the Boston Globe article uh, in the chat if he has not already, or we certainly be able to share that link uh, with folks. Uh, and I think the most important thing is just, you know, to never underestimate how dangerous extreme heat can be. Um, and we are we're actually, we're, we're, we're glad about it. We're embarking on a research project. Speaking of maybe not enough research being done, we're embarking on a research project with two uh, tough professors, tough university professors uh, this summer. Uh, that, and uh, the title of our project, uh, and, and we're funded by Tufts for it, is uh, uh, ex social connectedness in the age of extreme weather. And what does that look like? So we'll be happy to share some of the results as we're compiling this. We're compiling. We're compiling. We're going to com collect data uh, from community members in Dorchester um, and, and, and vulnerable communities, vulnerable aspects of Dorchester, and uh, we're going to we're going to get this data pu data published uh, uh, next year. Uh, and we're hoping to be able to contribute uh, something unique to the field. Uh, what uh, to specifically zeroing in on what does social connected look, connected mm -hmm. connectedness look like uh, in extreme weather and how important social connectedness is during extreme weather. Reverend Walker, thank you so much, Dr. Willenius, for thank you very much for a very rich discussion. And we'll close with announcing that our next grand rounds web webinar will focus on pollution, climate change, and health Wednesday, July 21st at noon. And Dr. Philip Landrigan, Director of the Program for Global Public Health and the Common Good, will present that day. He's at Boston College. Thank you all for, your, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.